Hi, everybody, and welcome to this new episode of Sage Makeup Friday Season 4. My name is Julian, and I'm a principal developer advocate focusing on AI and machine learning. As usual, please meet my co-presenter. Hi, everyone. My name is Segalan, senior data scientist working with the AWS Machine Learning Solution Lab. My role is to help customers get their ML projects on the right track in order to create business value as fast as possible. Thank you again for your help. Uh, so where are we in this season? So this is episode eight. Yes. Yes. It's the last one in our uh, automation series. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this week we are revisiting mm -hmm. uh, episode four, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so please remind us what was this episode about and <laughs> what are we going to do today? Cool. What are we adding today? What we are going to add. Yes, so um, last week, so during the last episode, um, we work on a recommendation use case uh, specialized for retail application, mm -hmm. uh, starting from an online online uh, retail data set. We train a model to, in order to predict the quantity of items that a customer is likely to buy. Okay. So we did the data science aspect uh, last time, and now we are going to see how to automate again. The okay, so pipeline. deployment, more pipelines, exactly. just, you know, we keep exploring and showing you different use cases, different examples, different uh, flavor, different flavors <laughs> of, uh, of SageMaker pipelines. Okay, so, um, so this, let me show you uh, the notebooks we are using today. So take a screenshot. Um, you can run all this stuff yourself, of course. Okay, we'll see that again at the end of the episode. And um, this is what we've done so far. Okay, so we started from that data set. Uh, we trained the model. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now we're going to look at deployment and uh, and of course automation okay so let's maybe uh let's maybe jump straight into uh, into our notebooks okay so so this is what we've done last time around so tell us a little bit about the data set maybe just quickly so that we remember what we did so you remember you we had a data set um contain which contain all the transaction mm -hmm. um, between uh, 20 and 2011 for a UK based mm -hmm. uh, online yeah, we can see retail store. Mm -hmm. And we got what? About 500,000 transactions. And after we had um, uh, <clears throat> a data set about the user as well. Right? Yeah, okay. So yeah, we have uh, yeah, we have information on customers, information on transactions. Exactly. Um, and, and it's mostly, uh, um, uh, it's a B2B data set, exactly. right? And so that's why you see uh, large quantities of items, right? Uh, I mean, no individual would probably buy, I don't know, uh, oh, yes. six white metal lan lanterns. I don't know, maybe maybe you would, or <laughs> six red woolly hats. You know, I don't know. So who you, knows? Who knows? Anything's who knows possible. Who, who, but who um, so this is kind of a this is a B two B again data set. So that's why you see large numbers. Um, and lots of transactions from the same customers, mm -mm, uh, which, exactly. which is really the case here. Um, and, and so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to, based on the number of, uh, uh, of items uh, that have been uh, purchased, we're trying to predict um, the, the items that uh, a certain customer would be interested in mm -mm, okay mm -mm. so it's it's recommendation um but what we're really trying to predict is the number of items mm, we're exactly. trying to build okay um so there's just a little bit of data processing so mm -hmm. we covered that in detail in uh, episode four so we won't talk about those different steps um go and watch episode four if you if you need details and what we will discuss is how do we automate that stuff. Mm -mm, mm -mm. okay so we have some uh, cleaning code, removing negative quantities, and yeah. that kind of stuff. Okay, so some pandas stuff, um, and and a little bit more. Okay, one hot encoding and uh, factorization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so we do that uh, here in the notebook. Again, we'll... remember we talk about the sparsity problem. Yeah, so what exactly. So the the one thing we we should uh, the one thing we should discuss just a little bit is obviously how sparse mm -mm. 
um, that data set is because you have uh, a large number of different items, mm -hmm. a large number of customers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you try and build that matrix, remember we, in episode four, we did discuss um, that uh, uh, matrix problem in mm -hmm. detail. So if you build a matrix with, let's say, uh, you, uh, customers as rows and items as columns, and you put the quantity in the, in the cells, uh, lots of cells will be empty. Okay, lots of cells will be empty. And so storing the data in that format is completely inefficient. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we can see here that if we build that matrix, it's 99.9% sparse. Fast. So you build that huge matrix, which is 99.9% .9 full of zeros. Mm -mm. So there's really no point in, in wasting storage like that and wasting compute because, of course, your algo will end up you know, multiplying zeros, adding zeros, and well, we know what the result should be, right? <laughs> so... In order to do better, uh, we actually use uh, a different format. So we use a, a sparse matrix mm -hmm. uh, object, uh, which is um, which is just a very dense, a very yeah, very efficient uh, and very compact representation of sparse data. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, just reminding you what we've done a few episodes ago, um, and um, and so we we build that sparse matrix. Uh, and we store it in protobuf form, Proto okay, so, uh, which is also very efficient, mm -hmm. um, a very efficient format for serialization. So we end up having those files with the training set and the test set um, stored as uh, protobuf encoded sparse, sparse matrices. Okay, quite a, a mouthful, apologize for that. Uh, but again, if you didn't see the, the, the number of episode four, just keep in mind, it's a very efficient uh, and very compact format to store sparse data. Mm -hmm. Okay, And the reason why we're doing this is because we are using the factorization matrix, matrix. algo, okay? which again, we, we discussed in detail last time around. And so that's the kind of uh, uh, data formatting you need to do. Okay? Mm -hmm. the, you, I, I guess you could still use, uh, you know, um, you could still use a dense matrix full of zeros. Mm. It's just that the file would be huge, mm -mm -mm. Impractic, impractically huge, mm -mm -mm -mm. Um, and very inefficient for, uh, storage. for for storage and for compute. Mm -mm -mm. Um, and you know, I guess there would be a point where it's just silly huge, right? If you have, you know, millions or tens of millions of products, and you know tens of thousands or maybe millions of customers, just multiply all of that, you know, uh, millions multiplied by millions. Yeah, yeah it, 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 you know, you end up having, you know, hundreds of gigabytes for nothing, mm -hmm. and maybe more, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why we're uh, insisting on this uh, more efficient format. Okay, so that's what we did last time around. Um, and then of course, um, then of course we did train, okay? Uh, and uh, there's really nothing special here. Uh, let's uh, just show you that code. By now, you should be super familiar with this. So, you know, created our estimator um, and um, uh, using the factorization ma machines algo, which is uh, built into SageMaker. And of course, we set hyperparameters. And here we use it in the regression mode because we're trying to predict the the empty cells mm -hmm. so to speak right the the unknown quantities for uh, all the items that are uh, all the products that are part of that matrix okay and then we train and we get a model okay so that's i think that's where we stopped uh, exactly. last time around okay mm -hmm. so now uh, i guess the main things are you know deployment automation uh, you know, uh, looking at executions and uh, talking a little bit about the options to automate data prep. Mm -mm. Because we saw that uh, notebook code, uh, that's fine. Um, so do we reuse that code? Do we do something else? We'll, we'll, we'll see about that. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's take a look at uh, deployment. Right. So there's a bit of a uh, lineage code here, which we'll look at again after pipelining. Uh, so deployment here is um, 
super simple and um, we just call the deploy API. And here, this is an example of doing everything in the same notebook, mm -hmm. right? I think in the last couple of examples, we had, we had yeah, the example, <laughs> the code was broken down in different notebooks. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we would train a notebook and then in another notebook, we would uh, grab the model and, and deploy it, et cetera, et cetera, right? And we use different APIs to do this. Remember, we saw, you know, the model API and the predictor API. And, you know, I think we used Boto3 uh, last week, et cetera, et cetera. So there are different ways to do this. Here, it's really the, the vanilla workflow, as I call it, right? So create your estimator estimator.fit to train and then uh, yeah that returns a predictor and then predictor.deploy to predictor okay so this is really the i guess the, the simplest way to do it okay so we deploy uh, on an m4 excel instance um, so say maker will provision that instance create um, an https api that we can invoke okay and in this case, we're pretty specific about the uh, uh, input and output format. So um, we can actually pass a custom serializer, okay? Because the, the factorization machines, uh, I'll go, expect data in a particular format, which, which is JSON, of course. Um, and and that uh, key called instances and uh, and you know then the, the different features. Okay, so we expect the data to be formatted this way. It's not it's not plain just plain JSON. Mm -hmm. But okay, so no big deal. We can create we can um, you know specialize the JSON serializer and create this class called FN serializer and we pass it like that. And for uh, the output format, we just use plain plain JSON. Okay. So uh, and I think it's something we've seen in previous uh, in previous weeks, right? Mm -hmm. We we tend to use the default uh, serialization and deserialization, but you can also customize it, and it's it's a good example of that. Okay, and then um, and then we can predict. Okay, um, and predicting is really not a problem here. Uh, you know, we're going to call the predict API, which is uh, somewhere below, right here. Okay, so predict or not predict. The slightly messy bit here is that, as you would expect and as you would fear, we need to pass the prediction data in the same format as the training data, mm -hmm. right? And and again, this is where this um, reprocessing code comes again. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So, Okay, remember we processed the data, we did one hot encoding and and a few more things. Okay, so the training set um, l now looks nothing like uh, training features, right? And looks nothing like the initial data set. And obviously, the the data that you send for prediction needs to be in the same format. So the way it's done here, uh, um, I guess, is is fine for. Uh, or dev and test, mm -mm -mm. okay? Uh, and um, the way it's done here is just, well, uh, we just pr take that raw data and process it using Python code, right? Applying the same transforms as we did for the training set. And, uh, and then we call predict, okay? So there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's fine. It's fine. Uh, you know, it's fine for now. Uh, but but I, have a few, <laughs> I have a few comments. Uh, Obviously, the, the, the first comment is we are duplicating code. Mm -hmm. um, and there's always a risk yeah. of uh, bugs, right? Mm -hmm. Or doing it differently. Um, errors. Yeah, errors, you know, different versions. So if we were, if we use different uh, languages, for example, mm -hmm. you know, for example, if we, you know, you train and you prepare and train with Python and you predict in C++. You could say, okay, well, I need to have this um, uh, prediction time feature engineering code in C++. So, okay, I'm gonna rewrite it. But here, you know, it's 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 a shame that we actually do that because we really duplicate the same code, mm -hmm. right? Uh, second thing is, it's not gonna be super efficient because it's it's yeah. Python code. It's not the fastest thing. 
So we end up, you know, adding a whole bunch of API calls before prediction. Uh, so latency is gonna is gonna suffer. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I'm sure you could find other ways. So again, fine for testing, but um, there's there's a better way. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a better way to do this. Uh, mm -hmm. And let's let's discuss it right now. And this better way is actually called inference pipelines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so now you're going to be confused because it's another type of pipeline. But okay, let's not talk about automation pipelines. Let's talk about inference running a pipeline of models at prediction time. Okay. Okay, so an inference pipeline is, it's a sequence of models. You can have up to five models, okay, okay that are invoked in order as a single unit. Okay. Okay. So what we do is, what, you know, the production grade solution here mm -hmm. would be, okay, first we train a data uh, a feature engineering model. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe we use let's say Scikit-Learn, okay. or maybe we use uh, Spark. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we train those uh, those featureizers. Okay, that transform um, the initial data into the feature engineer data, mm -hmm. and that's one model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and then we use uh, our actual uh, factorization machines algo. Uh, to train a second model that uses feature engineer data, mm -hmm. right? And, and then, of course, learns, okay? So now, instead of having feature engineering code that you need to duplicate and a model, you have two models, right? And you, again, you could have up to five, mm -hmm. where you would pass, you know, your incoming data in the uh, initial format, and it gets automatically um, propagated mm -hmm. through that sequence of models. And all that stuff is deployed as a single endpoint. Mm -hmm. okay? okay? So that's the thing. That's the you, you still invoke a single API, but the data flows through the featureizers and then through prediction and whatever, you know, maybe you have a post-processing step as well, I don't know. And you get your uh, your output data, okay? So this is this is what inference pipelines are. Okay, a sequence of models that are deployed as a single unit mm -hmm. on a single endpoint, but include different uh, prediction steps, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, there are just so many words you can use for those things. So it's called pipeline. So don't get confused. It's not the same thing as the SageMaker it's pipelines that we're using later. Okay, here it's really a, a, a pipeline for prediction for inference, okay? okay? So it's a it's a really nice feature. Like I said, you can use scikit-learn, you can use Spark. Uh, it's actually a very, uh, um, I'm not gonna say easy. It's, it, it's, a, it's a reasonably easy way mm -hmm. uh, to deploy Spark uh, models as well, <laughs> okay? And, and you can use uh, real-time prediction and you can also use that uh, for batch prediction. Mm -hmm. okay. And we, we, have some, we have some examples here. So uh, if you have that kind of problem, um, if you receive, you know, uh, raw data that needs to be feature engineered at prediction time, the, 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 I guess the production way is to, is to use inference pipelines, okay? Especially at scale and it's just cleaner, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, that way you, you end up not duplicating this stuff, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so that's, that's a bonus, okay? Fine. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a good one. It's, you know, you got to dive into it, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting way to do this, okay? And, that's, and then, of course, you know, we, if we did this, then we would literally get rid of all that stuff and we would just call predict on that, uh, uh, on that raw data that we receive. And again, data would flow through, you know, featureizers and prediction and, and you know, post-processing uh, models if you have that. Inference pipelines, check it out. Okay, so fine. Now we get to the point where uh, we want to start automating. Good. Okay, so we can move on to notebook three, where we just look at all the steps uh, we had in our workflow and, and we can start pipelining stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so here, 
we're going to talk, let's start with data processing once again, because as we know, it's everybody's, uh, ah, can I say nightmare? Well, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a lot of work, okay? It's a lot. So the way we did it uh, here, we, we used, you know, Python code that mm -hmm. we ended up duplicating, duplicating for uh, 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 prediction time uh, processing, but okay, different discussion. So it, it's code we wrote ourselves, right? And, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with it. No. Okay. Uh, so one way to automate this would be, well, let's just take that code once again and put it in a script. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's the same. So now we have three versions of the code, mm -hmm. right? We have the manual processing That's code. Easy. We have the manual prediction code and we have the automation. <laughs> so ah, you, you see where what the problems could be here. But okay, that's totally fine if, if you want to do it. Uh, just just be very careful about the versioning and, and mm -hmm. not you know drifting mm -hmm. one version and not the others. Okay. So we could just move all that processing code to this script, okay, and, and apply those same transforms and write our data as that uh, sparse matrix, okay, and split it and fine, right? So in a nutshell, copy paste your notebook code into a script, uh, turn this thing into something that Sage Maker Processing can invoke, mm -hmm. and you're good to go, and you have your first step of the pipeline, mm -hmm. okay? That's the first option. Now, there's another option, there's always another option. <laughs> Um, a few episodes ago, you know, we talked about SageMaker Data Different. Wrangler. Mm -hmm. Okay, remember that one, uh, where uh, you can manually, uh, you can manually uh, work on your data, uh, and you can, um, you know, you can manually uh, apply tons of different transforms. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and that's another way, right? Um, and and you can get exactly to the same point. You know, some people will love to write code. Some mm -hmm. people will, you know, would rather click here and experiment. And, and maybe you're doing both. And again, that's totally okay. Um, and so you end up having that data flow uh, with all the steps that you created, right? Mm -hmm. Drop, you know, drop missing, missing values value. and, and uh, you know, strip left and right, probably removing spaces in uh, strings, you know, factorizing, one-off encoding. Okay, just applying a lot of different steps to your uh, to your data. Okay, and hey, hey, there's this button here. Okay, <laughs> magic one. export step. That's good. Cool. Um, uh, and so that means now, now that I've clicked everywhere and <laughs> built my list of steps, what do I do with it? So, good question. <laughs> you can you can directly run it as a processing, uh, a SageMaker processing job yeah. and you get the output data in S3. Mm -hmm. So it's the, you know, uh, point and click and, you know, uh, fire and forget uh, <laughs> approach. I, I don't want to see the code. I don't care. Run the job. I want the process data. So, you know, for quick experimentation, I think this is fine. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Uh, there's uh, another option where you can export this stuff to SageMaker Feature Store, uh, which we've covered um, uh, quite a few times by now. Uh, we're not doing this here. And then you have two other options. Uh, one yep. that exports uh, the uh, that exports that flow, that uh, processing flow as Python code, okay? Uh, which is, I would say, plain Python, as you can see, right? It's not using any SageMaker API. So you could take that code put it in your uh, script uh, and, and use that directly. Mm -hmm. And that would save you from actually recoding mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, the steps that you defined interactively in Wrangler, in Data Wrangler. Okay. So that's, that's one way. And the final way is... Your favorite? A pipeline. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's my favorite, especially here because we are looking at you know automating everything with SageMaker pipeline. So what this does is it creates um, a SageMaker pipeline notebook, uh -huh. um, and we can see uh, you know the input, which is our data set, the output. Uh, 
Um, and we can see code to upload all the artifacts to S3. And we can see um, uh, parameters and we can see we are defining automatically that processing step. Is where we want to be. So, yeah, so this is the beginning of, you know, our, <clears throat> our final pipeline, right? Our end-to-end -end pipeline. So I think this is a good way uh, to, you know, cut and paste and, and mm. get your pipeline going. Um, then it has additional steps, you know, it, it defines a, uh, I don't want to say a dummy, but it's, let's say, an example pipeline where we train with XJBoost, you know, which is really not what we're trying to do mm. here. But, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, uh, an example of where you could go with SageMaker pipelines. So just show, if you're new to SageMaker pipeline, this is actually a good place mm -hmm. to start because, you know, a lot of uh, uh, boilerplate code is already there, okay? Uh, and so you could start from there and initiate your own pipeline, okay? So, so lots of options, right? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Lots of options. Uh, so here, you know, we, we went for... Um, we went for, hey, uh, I want to I wanna copy paste. Uh, I want to copy paste my notebook code into a processing script. Mm -hmm. And this will be my processing step. Okay, but we could have used the Python code coming out of Data Wrangler and we could have used uh, or, or modi reused the, the pipeline export mm -hmm. from Data Wrangler to get things going. Okay, I mean, just pick what you like. All right. Okay, so now let's go and uh, let's go and take a look at this pipeline. So the processing step is okay. Processing step is here. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have some uh, we have some artifacts. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have the pre-processing code which we, we just saw here. Okay, the one you copied from your notebook. So we upload that stuff to S3, and by now I think you're familiar yes. with um, processing steps. Uh, we define compute uh, resources here, scikit-learn processor object with the infrastructure requirements. Um, the input obviously will be our data set, and the outputs will be the training, training. training and test yeah. set in protobuf uh, sparse matrix format. format. Okay. Right, so step one, okay? <laughs> step two uh, is the training step, okay? And well, this uh, this is the easy one generally because you just reuse <laughs> your estimator. So this is where you're gonna happily copy paste, right? And this is one. exactly, and when I say exactly, I mean exactly. Exactly the same code you would use while experimenting, mm -hmm. okay? Maybe you'd want to, yeah, maybe you'd want to set some parameters for some of that stuff. I don't know. Here it's kind of a, it's a little bit hard coded, but okay. We could, we could use some parameters. And of course the input, the inputs are the training and test set that we just created. Okay. So for the 256th <laughs> time, we reuse outputs as inputs and this will automatically chain and the steps in the right pipeline. order yes <laughs> pretty cool so once you get over that pretty long syntax it's very easy okay and next um what do we do so um we can we're going to use the model registry mm -hmm. okay that's the register step we see here okay so uh the content type is important so data needs to be either in record io protobuf format or json works and the responses will be csv the allowed instance types for deployment mm -hmm. okay which is a good way to prevent accidental <laughs> deployment to humongous instances <laughs> that cost a little bit too much of course that never happens yeah, yeah. Um, and the approval status, which is probably set to uh, manual. pending manual yeah. approval, somewhere. because it's always good to have somebody check your model and formally approve it before uh, the, the, the downstream automation code goes and deploys that stuff. Best okay. practice. Yeah, probably <laughs> best practice. Okay, so that's one branch of the pipeline, and the other branch, uh, just like uh, in last week's episode, 
is uh, we want to deploy manually in our account mm -hmm. for, for testing, right? The, and so we create the model and deploy it using our scripts. And it's really, uh, it's really exactly the same thing as, as last week. Okay? We have some Python code to deploy the endpoint, etc. Okay, and you know, for the last time, uh, that manual deployment or script-based deployment is fine, you know, for quick testing, and that's that's okay. But um, I guess the more reasonable way is to register the model, and then let another team, another you know, somebody else. Um, you know, run checks. Maybe, maybe it's it. Maybe that somebody else is just your CI/CD mm -hmm. uh, toolchain, right? That just picks up the model and um, and runs some tests and uh, and you know then goes and deploys, right? But you have the flexibility to do both. Okay. All right, and then as before, we just chain the steps uh, and uh, we pass some parameters. You know where the data is and uh, the default approval status. And we create the pipeline and we run it, okay? And now you know where to go. We go to, oops, we go to <laughs> pipelines. And we see that personalization demo pipeline, which is already here, okay. And yep, the last one worked, but the other ones failed. Uh, why? So yeah, it's good. let's take let's look at the logs. So what happened on this thing here? Training. Ah, oh, training failed. Oh, Interesting. And let's look at the logs. And again, it's better than. The yeah, and again, if see for debugging, um, um, for debugging purposes. So this one failed. Oh, uh, because the value of one of the hyperparameters was not correct. Okay, so my my bad, you know, my bad. So you can choose. Yeah, but uh, it's pretty obvious, right? Yeah, it's, it's pretty obvious, and and the more recent output is at the top, unlike in CloudWatch, right? But after it's super useful when you need to debug uh, yep. your training and yeah, you can yeah, you can see everything here, and you know it's all there. So uh, all the job parameters. Uh, I guess there's no output here because it failed. Incorrect logs. <laughs> yep, and pipeline information, right? So it's all in there, and you have a link to the actual training job. What happens if I click on this? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm finding out. Oh yeah, okay. Yes. It takes me to the Sage Review <laughs> Console. Okay, all right. And but then you can see if you want to see the logs, you would have to go all the way down there and click in here. And that takes you to CloudWatch. And yeah, come on, CloudWatch. All right, all right. And then I got to click here again. And now I've got to scroll all the way down to find out what went wrong. Okay, of course, it's the same problem, exactly. right? So instead of doing this, you know. You just go to the app. Just, yeah, just Perfect. do this, mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's really convenient, right? Really convenient. So the, okay, this one failed, and right. I guess I fixed the hyperparameter <laughs> because you succeeded. Yes, yes. <laughs> and this one is green, so that's a good sign. Okay, right. And now all the steps worked. Okay. And all right, I can see again. Okay, no logs on registering. All right, it's all in there, mm -hmm. right? And I can see the model is pending manual approval, okay? And of course, if I go to the model registry now, uh, here, probably this. Yep, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, I already approved it, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I self-approved how this is super evil, don't do that, okay, of course. Of course. All right, but it's there. Okay. <laughs> All right, it's there. Okay. So again, in real life, you know, it would not be approved. <laughs> and uh, no, not by yourself. So, w however you do, you know, deployment, either it's it, either a manual step or you know, automation would go and you know inspect 
uh, inspect the model, look at metric, blah blah blah, and and go and uh, go and deploy, right? Okay, so we see we see all that stuff here. Okay, so this one worked. Uh, this one worked well. Okay, mm -hmm. well, pretty cool. Okay, um, and then I guess the last thing is uh, the extra, you know, the cherry on top mm -hmm. of pipelining is that uh, it builds lineage information automatically for you. Um, so you could build that yourself if you don't want to use pipeline and if you want to track, you know, which data set and mm. which script were used to create a model. You can, you have the APIs to do this, but if you use pipeline, you know, it's yeah. pretty obvious, right? Because you, uh, if you look at the, uh, of course, if you look at the execution graph, where is that thing? Here, yeah. It's pretty obvious, you know, what the order is and what the, what the artifacts were at every step of the way. And so this information is, of course, available. Okay, so you can just create this uh, lineage uh, visualization, uh, visualizer object, <laughs> and you can, uh, for every step of a pipeline, okay, so starting from a, a given execution, we can list the steps and we can print uh, lineage information at each step. Okay, so here we're actually doing that. We are looping on each step and showing you know, what the what the lineage information is. So here, for example, for the pre-processed data step, we see three inputs, mm -hmm. the script, okay, data. our pre-processing script, the data set, and the, container the, yeah, the container image that was used by SageMaker processing. So in this case, it's a scikit-learn image, okay? And these contributed to those two outputs, okay? Mm -hmm. And here, of course, we have a single execution and yeah, it's straightforward to remember what you did 10 minutes ago, <laughs> um, hopefully. <laughs> but um, if you have, you know, 50 executions exactly. and lots of pipelines and lots of different people running different things. You uh, would be very happy to. Yeah, you would be very happy to say, <laughs> wait, uh, you know, this execution has the best accuracy or the worst accuracy, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, what what went wrong, and so you have full traceability on you know this is the actual script that was used, this is the actual data set or the actual Docker container that was used, so you can know yeah you know why is this good, why is this great, and how to reproduce, right? Which it would be very very difficult otherwise. Okay, and now of course we have the same for for the training step. We see the inputs and the outputs. Uh, we have the same for uh, model registration, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And again, all this stuff comes for free here. Okay. Uh, it's, it's built automatically by pipelines and it's, it's stored. So you can go and retrieve at any point mm -hmm. the lineage for a given execution. And, you know, for, for those of you who have very strong compliance requirements, mm -hmm. if you need to demonstrate that model XYZ in production was built by this script and this code and this data set. This, 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 set, this yeah. is a really, really simple way to do it. Yeah, you've got yeah. data pre processing. Everything is a chain, yeah. so you can. Yeah. And it's, it. it's, it's stored, it's archived. Yeah. Um, so you, you, again, you don't need to build any tooling, you don't need to build anything. You just say, hey, okay, this, this model comes from this execution, and this execution gives me all the traceability that I need. Okay. So pretty nice, I think. Yeah, yeah pretty nice. It's super nice. Yeah, it's a problem, you know, it's a common problem that a lot of uh, data scientists and a lot of ops teams have. You know, mm -mm -mm. What, what is this model? Where does it come from? Well, now you, you can easily figure it out. Okay. All right, I think we're almost done, unless I forgot something. No, I think we're good. Yeah, I think so good. let's quickly recap. Um, so we started again from our uh, retail uh, recommendation example from a few weeks ago. And uh, we discussed uh, deployment mm -hmm. and uh, we discussed a little bit the, the problems that come with feature engineering at mm -hmm. prediction time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, you can duplicate your code, but, but... there's always a risk. <laughs> yes. uh, and performance is generally a little bit mm -hmm. uh, scary, uh, especially with Python, you know, there's a chance it's not gonna it's not going to help your, uh, your prediction time, prediction latency. So take a look at uh, inference pipelines. Okay, 
that's a, a more uh, solid way to do it, I guess. Um, and then we looked at, of course, automation. Okay, and uh, once again, we built an end-to-end -end pipeline, pipeline with, you know, not a lot of code, reusing actually a lot of code that we had in our mm -hmm. previous notebooks. So it's not super complicated. Uh, we saw some execution, uh, you know, bad ones, and where the logs are, good ones, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully good ones too. And and finally, uh, yeah, we looked at uh, lineage and how it comes literally for free um, when uh, when you use SageMaker pipelines. Okay, so let me show you that notebook once again. Okay, so here it is, All right? So take a screenshot, run it, hack it, you know, have fun <laughs> with it. And so this is the last one. Exactly. Yeah, this is the last, uh, the last one for automation, meaning that starting next, next week, week, we are diving into, whoops, what am I doing here? We're <laughs> diving into AutoML, okay? Uh, and so we'll, uh, we'll use uh, SageMaker Autopilot uh -huh. And uh, we'll use uh, autogluon, auto right? If you don't know what autogluon is, you'll find out. You'll find out about it. So two different tools for uh, one uh, one AWS service and one uh, open source library. Cool. And we'll try to build models automatically with very little code and see how we do, right? And uh, and we'll uh, we'll probably use new data sets just to keep things interesting, right? Um, so we'll see what happens there. Should be should be fun. AutoML is full of surprises sometimes. Okay, <laughs> we'll see what works and what doesn't work. <laughs> exactly. Okay, exactly. perfect. Yeah, and we'll dive into you know uh, we'll dive into that technology. Okay, Sego, thanks again. Thanks. Um, thanks everybody, and uh, we hope to see you next week to uh, discuss AutoML. Right. Until then, have a good week. Bye bye. Bye bye.